that on Friday of this week is that informational meeting um, about the, our summer inset. And so I'd encourage all of you to go and find out more about it because it's a great program. As I said, it's an intern program. It's a great resume builder. It opens up doors for the future. You get to work with faculty and graduate students over at UCSB usually. Uh, then when you do your presentations, a number of students have been selected to travel to the conference and, and then that leads to more doors. And as I said, I've had a number of students who besides getting to UCSB have gotten full ride scholarships or offers to Ivy League schools and, uh, bec because of that. So again, great opportunities open up. Um, highly competitive, uh, but, but show up on Friday to, to, to find more about it. It's right during summer school, so you do have to sacrifice going to summer school. Um, and it's an intern. It's a paid intern. Um, but, um, you know, if you were fortunate enough to get selected, I, it's, it's probably worth sip, skipping summer school. It could be... Uh, tough call. Yeah, yeah, tough call. Because, uh, uh, I mean, if the whole year, that's a little different than what I'm thinking. I'm thinking one class, you know, double up next time. But, but again, the doors that open up and the opportunities can, you know, really uh, abound there. But you can get those other, you know, ways along in your education. Uh, I do want to pass out this sheet. I don't, I don't think I passed out this one. This is one that lists uh, two scholarships by our foundation that uh, many of my students in the past has overlooked. The first one is the Converse Scholarship. I want to point that out because it is um, uh, a large amount. It's one of our largest scholarship. It's $2,500. Um, it's a scholarship that we have the most of. I think they give 20 of them out every year. Kind of depends on the funding, but somewhere between 12 and 20, $2,500 uh, scholarships. And the way it's listed on the uh, scholarship page, it's, under, it's listed under cross disciplines. And I know in the past a lot of my students have missed it because they're looking in the physical sciences or the engineering area and they never realize that there's this opportunity. Um, and it, it probably has one of the most flexible and liberal requirements. So I know a lot of you um, would, would A, qualify, and a lot of you, if you do apply, will get awards uh, for it. And uh, I know there's been a number of years where um, fewer than 20 people have applied, and they're giving 20 scholarships. So everybody who qualified uh, got one. And um, the, um, so they can do this on the website? Yeah, and if you don't know, uh, go to, of course, the City College and the financial aid, and then that's where all the scholarships are. So yeah, you, you, you all should go there uh, right away and just scan through all those and see which ones. I mean, some of them are looking for ABC and other ones are PDQ, you know, and so there's, there's different qualifications, but as you go through that, you'll see that uh, it's not just uh, GPA and academics, it's, it's financial need, it could be uh, gender, it could be background, it could be ethnic, it could be uh, location. I mean, there's a lot of different things, but, but you'll find a lot of scholarships. I mean, we are very fortunate here at City College. We have one of the largest uh, scholarship programs and foundation of any community college. I, I, I think maybe any community college. We got, uh, I mean, I guess that's the good side of, of Santa Barbara, and there's a lot of money here, and a lot of people who who donate it. And uh, now, I don't have any of it, but that that's too bad. But I did see yesterday a red Ferrari, really, really nice red. Fer I couldn't believe it. I was driving to work, coming down the freeway right here, and it gets on the freeway at Millpost right in front of me. It's like, whoa! Slow down, move in behind it. And I think I scared the lady. She'll stalk her. And <laughs> about 90 miles an hour in front of me. Whoa, well, uh, have a good day. <laughs> really nice, brand new red Ferrari. Yeah. I think someone's trying to get in. Speaking of money. Enter at your own risk, yeah. Our, uh, see if I can get this. Our wonderful locks that are supposed to be automatic just don't... Automatic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nope, that didn't help. All right, nothing I can do about it. 
All right. Yes, question. They do it every year. Oh, yeah. Oh, good point. Uh, it was open last semester. Um, and that was because the, this time last year, not enough people applied. And so they offered 20, and I think they only awarded 10, and so they reopened it. And so that's why they reoffered it. You applied? I applied last semester. Huh. Uh, I, I, sorry, I don't know the answer to, 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 to that. Um, but, but anyways, um, yeah, and I'm glad you brought that up. On a bigger note, all these scholarships, uh, this is the time to be applying for them. And they're, they're due, like, I think they're, if you go to the website, they give the date. Are a lot of those, like, March 2nd? Yeah, 3rd. 3rd? Okay. And so that's, that's typical, our, the, the, the closing period here. All right. And I thought I would pass this one around to not as useful to you as, as Don and the review, but those are our tutoring hours this year. And as I promised you on the first week, we, we always start our tutoring on the second week and uh, we have funding for about 12 hours. And so here is uh, Tyler and Zippy in there. And so we've got three hours uh, Monday through Thursday. And uh, good news here is uh, both of them have already gone through Physics 123, so they are more than capable of answering your questions in, in 123, which is always a challenge with our uh, tutoring because, you know, this is the most advanced class. And so getting somebody to tutor in there with the most advanced sometimes can be challenging because they've, you know, the students like you guys who are at the end of the program then transfer. You're, you're, you're gone. And so a lot of you won't be around next semester to, to do the tutoring. And so getting somebody who knows the information about our top class is sometimes hard. And that's why we have Don for, for you guys. And then we have the tutoring center for the Physics 102 and the 101 and the 105 because we always will have somebody in there who knows that material. All right. Well, as I promised, I better get jumping into here if we are going to cover all this material in a short time here. So let's see how far and what we can cover with chapter 16. As I said, we'll, we'll blast out what we can and then call it good and move into 17. But this is the extension of 15. 15, if you recall, was about oscillations. And so we started with a mass on a spring. We pulled it down and it would just go up and down. If you look at this contraption I have right here, if I had just one rod sticking out and I pulled it up and I let it go, it would oscillate up and down. And so the extension of what we just did in 15 and what I'm about to do today for you is that what if I had a bunch of rods connected together? So when I lift up the first one to make it oscillate, what does it do? Yeah, instead of continue to sit here and oscillate, it transfers its energy to the next, which transfers to the next, which transfers to the next. And so instead of having a single object that oscillates, I have a flow of energy which goes from one oscillating object to another to another, to another. And the main part I want to start out here is I hope you will notice this, that when I make this little movement, this oscillation, the energy flows along here, but there was no movement of the material. And that's where we're going to get started. That's Id our idea of a wave. And so chapter 16 is what we call a wave motion. What is a wave? And probably a simple layman's way of describing a wave is really saying it is the movement or the transmission of energy, but not the material itself. And so that property makes it a little different than the stuff we did in Physics 121, where is if we were had an object like a baseball, and the baseball went from point A to point B, well, the energy would go from point A to point B, but also the material would too. And so we would have two things moving. Waves, we don't. We just have the flow of energy. And so kind of the place to get started here is with vocabulary. 
And so if you've got a chance to read it, and I hope you did already read chapter 16, the author starts off and, hey, let's use some words. Fortunately, a lot of the words we use for waves are a lot the same what we just used in chapter 15 for oscillations. And so if I were to come back here and make not just one wave, or what we'll call a wave pulse, but a series of them, it would look something like this. I'll put a dotted line down the center to kind of indicate, okay, that's kind of the equilibrium point for all these rods. And so that's kind of no disturbance right there. And so as I make a wave, a pulse, another pulse, and I'll stop, otherwise it gets kind of crowded. In fact, you can see it goes down and re reflects back. But there's a bunch of words. And for quickness of it, maybe I will just kind of say, let's look at a couple maybe in groups. You're going to hear the word crest and trough. I probably are familiar with those words, but just in case, what is the crest of a wave? And I'll just say it is its highest point. And so here and here and here and here is the crest. What is the trough of a wave? Okay, it's lowest point, and so as we look across the wave, we will see low points. How about this word, amplitude, which we will use the symbol A, which by the way, didn't we have amplitude last chapter? And what is its last chapter, which is very similar to this chapter, not much has changed here. What's amplitude? Yeah, it's the maximum displacement. And in this case, those would be rods, but the maximum displacement. And so, as I was making a set of waves here, You will hopefully notice then that if you look at just one rod, one rod by itself is chapter 15. It is simple harmonic motion. And it would go up and down and have an amplitude. But if you look at that one rod, let's say that one rod is this one here. At that moment, that rod has gone up to its amplitude. Of course, a little bit later, it will move back to equilibrium, and a little bit after that, it'll move back to it, what I'll call its lowest point, it, uh, which really represents this point, the trough kind of moving over there. And so as these rods move up and down collectively, it has the visual effect of this point moving to here. Again, emphasizing nothing material-wise moved from here to here, but what happened is this rod came down lower, that one came down lower, that one came down lower, that one came down lower, and that one came down lower. But the point is then this point here, or this height here, is the amplitude as we would have saw last chapter for simple harmonic motion, but it is also what we would call the amplitude of the, the wave. It is how high it goes. And if you watch this wave move along, then these crests move along, always having that same height. But of course, that height comes from individual rods, where the individual rods go up to that height. So again, don't want to make a big deal out of it, but I want to point out there is a difference between 15 and 16. There is a difference between a simple object and simple harmonic motion that we did in chapter 15. And and the extension of that, which we are now doing in 16, where it's a whole group of rods going up and down, or water waves, or sound waves, or light waves. And this chapter is just that. Let's talk about waves in general, and then start applying them to other type of waves. And so we're going to deal with waves as a general principle, and next chapter is about sound waves, and coming up in the future are light waves, and coming up after that are material waves. And of course, in this chapter, we will talk about just what we call mechanical waves, rods that go up and down, a tight string that we shake back and forth. But again, maybe I'm making too big of a deal out of it, but the amplitude is essentially the same thing we saw in 15. So we use the same symbol, we use the same name, but again, what is different is it's a group of rods, not just an individual rod. And that does lead us to something that we did not have in the last chapter, we did not have something called a wave length. Greek letter lambda will be our 
symbol for it. What is wave length? Yeah, I'm kind of a simple definition here. You can see a more formal one in the book, but let's just say it's distance between, and we might even say minimum distance, but mist distance between two identical points or two adjacent identical points, whatever phrase you want to convey, that it's the shortest distance between those two points. And so you can see here why this wave up here, and of course my action up here, that as we make these waves, as this energy flows along, there's a, a, a repeating pattern. And so we can ask the question, how much distance is between those repeating patterns? And that's the, the wavelength. So up here, if I were to make a mark from crest to crest, that would be the wavelength. How far from identical points. It could be trough to trough for that matter. It, it could also be equilibrium to equilibrium, but I should probably be careful and say that it would be from equilibrium here, not the next equilibrium, but this one, because that would have to go to an identical rod, which this rod is at equilibrium and on its way up. And this one is on its way up, but this one is at equilibrium and on its way down. So that's not an identical uh, point there. But I think you get the gist of it, and I know you saw it in 102. So again, probably nothing new here other than I wanted to make really clear is we haven't seen that symbol this semester, and the symbol is lambda, and it represents the distance. Not to be confused with period. Now again, we used this one in the last chapter. What was the period again? Yeah, this was the time for two, well, well, okay, I'll, I'll spell it out in terms of waves. We saw it uh, in chapter 15 defined a little bit differently, but it comes out to be the same thing. But I'm going to say here, it's the time for two identical points to pass by a given point. <coughs> and, and here's what I mean by that. Let's go back to this wave again. Uh, I'll take this little edge right there and, and uh, maybe I'll even put myself in the wave right there. Maybe this is a water wave or something here. Okay? And, and so as I stand here in the wave, and in this case it looks like the crest has gone over my head, but as the crest gets over there, there is going to be a certain amount of time before the next crest gets there. And so that is the period. How much time does it take? Don't confuse that, of course, with wavelength. The wavelength is how much distance is it to the next one. Or you could put another way, how much distance is going to have to travel before that identical one gets here. And so these are closely ideas the same in that they have to do with two identical points, but one is how much distance is between those identical points, and the other one is how much time is between those two identical points points. Now, with that said, that is really the same thing we did in 15, because in 15 we did not have a series of oscillations, we only had one. And if you can imagine this being either a water wave or this rod, as these go up and down, if your focus is only on one object going up and down, then as you watch it go up and down, the time for one cycle is what we called the period in the last chapter, right? And that really is the same thing, because watch what would happen here. As I stood right here, this rod would go down, 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 and eventually be down here, a trough. Which of course would be corresponding, really, to this rod coming down, this rod coming down, this rod coming down, and it would have a visual effect of this point moving to here. Now again, remember, this point doesn't actually move to here, but what does happen is the series of rods come down and give the appearance that it moves to here. 
So the time for it to go down here is also the time for the trough to move over to there. Then if it goes back up, that would actually be like these rods going up. And so this point visually would have moved to here. Remember, this material here did not actually move here. What actually happened is this rod went down and back up, and these all did the same thing. And so the time for this to go down and back up what we defined as the period in the last chapter, chapter 15, is really the same as this definition of period, which is how much time would it take for this point to come over to there. So I think I'm, I'm hoping you will see the tie together with last chapter, but I hope that also you'll see there's a, a bit more complication going on now than the last chapter. Because in the last chapter, we just had a single object going up and down, and everything was a function of time. Now, We've got things that change as a function of time, but that also depends on where they are in space. And so we have a more complicated issue that depends not only on time, but also on space. Where of those individual rods are we talking about? Because all these individual rods have simple harmonic motion, yes. They all are a function of time, yes. But their phase is all different depending on where their position is. And so I have both a function of position and a function of time. And I didn't have function of position last chapter. I only had function of time. So again, see how it carries over, but please see how it is a bit more complicated than last time. And they are so closely tied together that that can get overlooked. Frequency. Same symbol we saw in the last chapter, F. And again, the definition slightly changed, but really coming from the same thing, it says here that this would be the number of identical points passing a given point per second. And again, hopefully that kind of rings the same bell that we just did with period. This, this definition of frequency for wave is a little bit different than the definition we saw back in the last chapter. But they go hand in hand. Because see, in the last chapter, we said the frequency was the number of cycles it did in one second, right? Whereas now, I am saying it's the number of identical points that pass me. So if this is me in the wave and this crest and then this crest and this crest, three crests go by me every second, this is saying I have a frequency of three, three hertz, three identical points every second. But the reality is those three crests didn't actually move. Those three crests, and I'll say it one more time here, really come from the fact that this going down and come back up is really visually the same as this point sliding across there. Because as this comes down, the reason it looks like this point moves over to here is because this came down. And then when it goes back up, it has that visual effect here. So one cycle and one movement of an identical point are exactly the same, which is what I was trying to say back when we did period, and what I'm trying to say here when we do frequency. And so it kind of has that same behavior. It's a different view of the behavior because we're looking at it as if particles are moving, but remember, particles aren't moving. It's really just kind of more of a synchronized motion as they go along. And so it will serve us well to think of the frequency not like last chapter where how many times did it go up and down, but how many crests traveled to us. So whether you want to think of it as three cycles going up and down or three crests moving all the way over, it means the same thing. And that's what I want to point out. So not a surprise, we use the same word frequency. Not a surprise, we use the same word F. Not a surprise, we use the same units for frequency, which is hertz, that we did in the, in the last chapter. So as I said, the beginning part, Pretty straightforward here in the sense that it is just an extension of what we've done. But I think it is important that we go through these definitions because it's kind of easy to miss how these definitions are just a little bit different than what we saw in the, in the last chapter. And so thinking about them a little bit different can add up. Well, two more here and then we will do something a little bit different here, actually get into some math. But uh, what if I put here 
this idea of a transverse wave. The disturbed particles, and I know it's kind of a vague description, the particles, because again, I don't want to say sound waves versus water waves versus light waves versus matter waves versus these waves on a string or waves made out of these rods here. So I'm just going to say the disturbed particles then move, and this is the key part, perpendicular to the wave motion. Now, maybe I better pause there because do you see two different motions when I do this? Now again, doesn't it look like something is flowing along here? And I would say something is flowing. Energy is flowing, but not material. And so that's what I mean by the wave motion. That's the part that we got started 10 minutes ago and said, look, what do we mean by wave motion? The motion of the wave is the flow of energy, not the flow of the material itself. The material itself, what these rods are made out of, are moving which way? Up and down. They are moving perpendicular to the flow of the energy. What I am showing you now is the standard transverse wave. Most people, I think, think about waves always as being transverse. Oh, let me show you another set of transverse waves. You probably noticed this machine here. These two are transverse waves. They travel a little bit faster, kind of makes sense. They're made out of rods that are a little bit shorter because they're shorter, they have less inertia. You kind of expect them to move a little bit, bit quicker. So here I have fast moving waves. Here I have some slow moving waves. But both of these are the traditional transverse wave. Um, I think most of you probably think as water waves as always being transverse. They're not, but you say, okay, what happens? You, you go out to our pier, you watch. You see the wave coming in and you watch the bird or the boat or the surfer go up and down and the movement of the water is obviously up and down, but the flow of the energy is along the surface of the water. Transverse waves. But that's not the only type of waves we can have. And so we are also going to be discussing a longitudinal wave. And here it says that again there is some motion of waves. So I will put here the disturbed particles but in this case they move which way? Same direction. Yeah, I'll use the word parallel to the wave motion. And this one may be less common to you. You may have seen it back here. Here is my third wave machine. It's kind of buried behind all these, so I'll lift it up so you can see it. But again, I have rods. But in this case, the rods are laid out vertically and there's springs between them so that if I were to push on the first rod, that would make a disturbance to the second, to the third, to the fourth. And so there's a flow of energy, right? There's not a movement of the material. This is a wave action. Energy flows without the material. And so I do have a flow of energy. Which way is the movement of the rod? in the same direction or parallel to the flow of the energy. And so this is what I mean by a longitudinal wave as opposed to a transverse wave. Slinkies are nice. They kill a straight longitudinal wave pretty well too. If I were to release the first link, you can kind of see it pushes on the next, pushes on the next, pushes on the next, pushes on the next. And so there is a flow of energy, in this case, down the length of the slinky. And the compression of the slinky is in that same direction of the flow of the energy. <laughs> okay? And so that is another example of a longitudinal wave here. 
And so we can have waves in those two categories. Well, we've got more words to, to learn, but that's a real good place to get started with those words. So now, let's jump into the math here. And the first one is the same math we saw in the, the last chapter, because again, you can hopefully see that extension of what we did in the last chapter. That really what we have is just many oscillating objects. So whatever was true in the last chapter must continue to be true in this chapter, but then collectively with them together there could be other parameters and, and that's what we're going to see. Because I'm going to start with this relationship. Any connection between period and frequency? Yeah, and we're going to end up with the same relationship. Now again, we're kind of looking at period and frequency a little bit different than we did in the last chapter, but they would have obviously be connected. In the last chapter, we said it was the time for one cycle, and this was the number of cycles per second. So they were reciprocals of each other. Okay, so in this chapter, they're really kind of that same thing. Here, it's the time for two identical points to pass a given point. So here's a given point, here's a crest. So when that first one gets there, how long does it take for the next one to get there? Okay, and so that's the time as the wave to go up and down. But of course that would be the reciprocal then of this, which is the number of identical points that pass there every second. So not a surprise, although looking at it slightly different, we, we, we have the same mathematical result. So if you know period, you know frequency, just like like last chapter. And again, makes sense. We, we must. They're, they really are, waves are just made out of a bunch of oscillating objects. But how about the velocity of the wave? And I'll just put under here wave for the first time. Because I do want to make sure that this is clear. This is what we did not see in chapter 15. Do you see two different speeds here? You see, when I make a little hump right here, I could say, what is the speed that the energy is flowing? The speed of the wave. But I could also say, what is the speed of the material? What's the speed of the rod? Now, that we did in the last chapter. And maybe we should do it again by saying, in this point right here, I am not saying the derivative with respect to time of the A cosine omega t plus phi. That's the speed of the oscillating object. That's a, the second speed that I think you already know from last chapter and want to make it very clear. I'm not talking about that speed. If I do take the derivative as we did last time, that, what does that equal? Uh, derivative of cosine is negative sine. The omega would pull out and we would get this. So if I was asking what is the speed of the material? What is the speed of the rod, one individual rod? Well, again, I'm really asking last chapter. I'm really asking this vertical motion and I'm taking the derivative of its position. So I will call this the velocity in the y direction. At least it would be a y direction if I had a transverse wave. If I had a longitudinal wave, it would be the x direction also and that can get a little confusing. But I do want to make sure I am not talking about the velocity of the wave here. So we've got two discussions, two different velocities. And this one we've already had. I want to have this one now. What's the speed of the wave? How fast is the energy flowing? If I were to watch that crest move along, how fast does it move? Yeah, and maybe a picture could be useful here again. But if you pick a particular point like right here, at that moment, there is a crest. And if you wanted to find out how fast it is flow, uh, moving, you would say, well, it is the distance it travels in the time it takes. I guess more appropriate for this class would be the limit as the time goes to zero. But these travel, unless we change something, the same speed, and you know, obviously they get over to here, 
there's a different speed, but as long as they're all within the same medium, if you will, the same side rods, they're all going to go the same speed. They're going to change the speed when they go from the short rods to the long rods, but with keeping it simple here for the moment, as long as they're within the same medium, it is a constant speed. So there's no difference between the quotient and the, the d derivative here. But mentally I can do this. If I ask myself that I will start my watch when the crest gets here, and I will stop my watch when the next crest gets there, then the time it takes is one period, right? And how far did the wave travel? Yeah, one wavelength. And so our second formula, and new to us, or at least this semester new to us, is that the velocity would be the wavelength divided by the period. And so, so far, as we are studying our waves, we've got two equations to, to work with. And so these are related in this sense of distance and, and time. And in fact, what would happen if I put that equation together with this equation? Yeah, I would have velocity equals wavelength times frequency. And I think you might be a little bit more familiar with that one. I know both of these equations, actually all three of these equations, you did see in the, in the Physics 102, the, the, ch the chapter uh, 15. So, so none of that is new other than the fact we've probably made a more detailed analysis by looking at the fact that we have the velocity of the wave and we have the velocity of the materials that make up the wave. And we don't want to mix those two. Okay? And so that's a good mathematical place to start. So let's keep going. Uh, some other interesting mathematics and math that you haven't seen, at least in this class. Those of you who've taken math 220 um, have probably seen some of this, um, but only some of it because your focus was on learning to solve differential equations. So I'll point that out as we go along here. But let's talk about the equation of a wave. I mean, before we even get to the equation of a wave, let's just talk about a wave here for a moment. I mean, let's do this for a moment. Let's just say I make a little pulse like that. And so that might be what I'll call time equal to zero. So ready, right now, if you took a snapshot. And so my little wave my little pulse, if you will, I will say right here is time equals to zero. And so this is my coordinate system, x and y. Now what would happen a moment later? Right, I would have the same shape, but it now has moved, and in this case moved over to the right. Uh, I'll put x1 here, to kind of represent that, okay, this, this wave is no longer centered around x equaling zero. It still has the same shape, but it now has moved over. And of course, I will call this maybe t1 a little bit later. So time. And keeping with this pattern, and maybe this will give us some insight then into the mathematics, is a moment after that, what would it look like? I guess it would be something like that. Same shape, but further over, centered at a new position, x2, if you will. And so I would say the time is number two. And here's what I'm getting out of this. Could you give me the mathematical conditions of a wave? In other words, here's the physical conditions. The physical conditions of this is the wave has to move and keep its same shape. What's the requirement then for a mathematical function Why doesn't to move and keep its same shape? Simply put, I want to start off by not every function then can be a wave, right? I mean, if I were to write on the board y equals x times t. Is that a wave? Oh, absolutely not. 
I mean, what would that look like? I guess at first when time equals to zero, what would I get? Zero. For all x's, I would get zero. A moment later, one second later, what would I get? Right? T equals one. And so this is x, this is y. I'd get that. Time equals two, what would I get? Does that function have the same shape and move along? No. All right. So you're seeing my point here that not all mathematical functions represent waves. Which ones do represent waves is my question. Okay, definitely a sine and a cosine, except go with that. And that's not the only ones. But you're on the right trail. In other words, if I just put y equals sine x, is that a wave? Right, that doesn't move. If I were to put that function on the board, it looks like this. I'd say time equals to zero, and at time equals one second, what does it look like? Same thing. <laughs> and at time equal to three, what does it look like? Same thing. There's no function of time. There's no movement in here. All right, so you're beginning to see what I'm after, and the first one is hopefully pretty obvious that if you're going to mathematically represent a wave, it has to be both a function of space and time. It's got to have both in there. And maybe that's so self-obvious, I didn't even need to, to bring it up, right? But I felt like I better because before this chapter, in chapter 15, we did not have a wave. We had x equals to a cosine omega t plus phi. Is that a wave? No. It's an oscillational motion. It changes with time, but it doesn't change with space. It, it doesn't take that same shape and, and move along. So we're extending, obviously, what we have done. We started with this, a single oscillating object, and we put them together. And for me to mathematically represent a wave, it has to be both a function of space and, and, and time. And so that's why I tr started with one that was both a function of space and time. Maybe I should have started with something as simple as just space or something as simple as time. But if you only have one of those variables, it can't be a wave. But even if you have both the variables, it still may not be a wave. So let's come over here. Let's look closely at this. What is this math? How could I take something of the same function and a moment later it's moved over to the right and has the same shape? And maybe we should just put a type of function here. Well, why don't I just kind of guess at maybe the equation for that? And maybe that will help. Um, this to me kind of looks like it might be a Gaussian function. Curves up, comes down. I don't know, are you familiar with Gaussian functions? A few of you? <laughs> so I don't know, is this, maybe this wouldn't help. Uh, but, but can you see an exponential and then you put an x and you square it? So in other words, we have a decaying exponential on both sides. It doesn't matter if you have negative x's or positive x's. When you square it, you get a positive number, so when you put it in front, you get a decay on either side. Okay, so whatever function you want to kind of describe here, which again, this is, happens to be called a Gaussian function. Some of you might re recognize it as a bell-shaped curve. It's used a lot in statistics. But let's just say that is my, my function, okay. Then it would have this distribution when time equals to zero, right? How could I get that same shape over here? Ah, good. And so this is the property that I'm sure you learned somewhere in your algebra class. We were doing it in the last chapter. We were shifting the axis, right? How do you shift something along the x-axis? Well, that's what this means, right? We have now then taken that function and then when x equals x1, right here, in this argument is a zero. 
And so we would get the same shape centered around x1 as we got centered around 0. How would I mathematically represent this one to have the same shape as back here? e to the minus? Good, x minus x2. So, in case you've forgotten, how do you take a function and shift it along the x-axis? Right there, right? x minus something. Now, if I want that something to represent its motion with speed, and I guess I've erased it here, but wouldn't velocity equal distance divided by time if we have a constant velocity? And so that really means that if x2 is really representing velocity times time, that's how far it has shifted over. Fair enough? And so this wave could be mathematically described in general. Well, let me leave it over here. But if I wrote this as e to the minus x minus vt squared, that's the insight I want you to get out of this chapter here. That anything that has this form, here's what it means. What it means is the center position, if you will, is going to move over on this velocity based on time. And since the function is, is in this argument is still itself, you're going to get the same shape. And so simply put, not only would a wave have to be a function of both space and time, but space and time would have to be connected in that sense. If you do not have an x minus a vt in that equation, you will not get the same shape just shifted over. Again, I think you could illustrate that if I wrote y is equal to e to the minus, what if I wrote it as x times t squared? What would that look like at time equals zero. Well, at time equals to zero, I would get a zero up here, right? E to the zero is one, regardless of what x is. Oh, I mean, I did that wrong. Time equals to zero. I'll change colors and say, what would it look like when time equals one second? <laughs> okay, I'd put a 1 here, and so I would get that shape at time equal to 1. That's not the same shape moved over, is it? It's a totally different shape. But what would I get at time equal to 2 seconds? Well, I guess I'd take 2. 2 squared is 4. So I'd have a Gaussian with a, with, with a 4 in it, so this whole thing, everything would be just a little bit larger. And so points here would hang down and points there would go up. Now again, is that the same shape, only shifted over? No. So there's no way this can be a wave. And so again, two points here is that to be a wave, it has to be a, both a function of x and t. But in addition to that, the x and t have to be related in such a way that hopefully we see in the mathematics that x minus vt goes into the argument. Any other mathematical function will not have the same shape just shifted over on the, on the x-axis. It'll have a totally different shape. And that's what you see with this function. So that is not a wave. And so this is the lesson that that would have to be the mathematical form of a wave. Now, could it be a sine? Yes. Could it be a Gaussian? Yes. Could it be a Lorenzen? Yes. Could it be, could it be, could it be? Yes, yes, yes. So there's a lot of different shapes I could have, but it has to have both an x and a t, and they have to be related with an x minus a vt. 
Hey, let me take it one more step. What if this wave was moving to the left instead of to the right? What would be different here? Right. If this was over to here, then I would have a plus x1. And that's what happened if the velocity was the other way. Uh, so just to make it clear for people, we like to write it this way, that for a wave to work, what we call wave equation, we have to have y equals some function that has both an x and a t, and the x and the t have to be related with this relationship, either an x minus of et or an x plus of et. The minus would then represent a wave going to the right. The plus would represent a wave going to the left. And so there's some of the biggest mathematics of the chapter. What is the wave equation? And so we can have all kinds of different waves. All right, here's an example of the first one I gave you. y equals an exponential minus x either plus or minus vt squared. We would call that a Gaussian wave. Oh, we could also have something like this, 4 over x plus or minus vt squared plus 3. Now again, would that be a wave? Yeah, it would. In fact, you may not be as familiar with that shape. It's a Lorenzian shape. But if I put in time equals to zero, uh, what I would have, and I'll look at x equals to zero first, I would get four over three here. And as I went to positive or negative values of x, and that kind of looks like what I had before. So I'm going to make it a little more narrow so you can kind of see there is a a difference to it. It's kind of a little taller and steeper depending on what these numbers are, so I don't want to draw it too much. But it, but it kind of has this Gaussian look, but it goes up and it has, again, a fancy name, a, a Lorenzian look here. Okay, But it is still a wave because a moment later, when time equals to, say, one second, then the same shape would now be centered over to here or here, depending if V is a, you know, if it is a plus or a, or a minus. But you will get the same shape. You'll get a Lorenzian shape. It'll be just shifted over. So is that a wave? Yes. And obviously, as you guys pointed out, probably the most significant one to us is going to be that. <laughs> And that's the one we're going to spend the majority of the time discussing here. That if you have something that, say, at time equals to zero, time equals to zero, and you plot it, it looks like this. As time goes forward, of course, depending to the right or to the left, but let me draw one to the right. So using the minus sign, this would now... look like that. And so the crests would be visually in motion. I'd have the same shape, just shift it over. And each moment in time, shift it over. So again, let me say it again. This is the wave equation. This is a big, important part of making sure that we have a wave. If we don't have both x and t, it's not a wave. If the x and t are not related in this fashion, we don't have a wave. But if they are related, we do have a wave. And we can look right away at whether the wave is going to the right or to the left by looking at the sign. That is the wave equation. Now, there's another way of looking at the wave equation, and I want to point that out. Not so much for this chapter or even this semester. Uh, we will see it later on in this class a little bit. We will see it a little bit in Physics 122, but really most of you will see it in great detail in your Math 220 because the wave equation is a really nice differential equation that uh, it 
good to teach students how to solve differential equations. So that's why you see it in 220. A lot like this last chapter we did with the oscillations. I'm sure you, you guys did oscillations in your 220. Anybody take 220? Oh, you, you even did a little bit in 160. You do a lot more, though, in, in, in two, 220. But yeah, because again, oscillational motion has that differential equation that is really good to study. And so do, do waves. You don't do any waves in 160, though, do you? No, just springs. Just springs, yeah. yeah. Uh, but I know that this differential equation is nice. Because watch this here. If I take the wave equation, y, well, y equals some function that is related to space and time this way. If I take the derivative of it, let's take the derivative of y with respect to x. And then let's just do it a second time. Take the derivative of y again with respect to x. Now since I'm being kind of vague here, I'm not saying what kind of function is. I'm not saying is it a Gaussian, is it a Lorenzian, is it a trigonometric uh, function. I, I'm not saying any of those. So the only thing I guess I could r really do is say, well, that's derivative and that's second derivative. All right. That's about all I can do. But watch this. What if I take the derivative with respect to time? What would I get there? Well, good. I would get a chain rule piece of this. I would get not only first the derivative of the function, but the chain rule would pull out a plus or minus v, right? And if I did it a second time, derivative of y with respect to time, I would get a v squared. No plus or minus, because if it's minus, I'd pull it out twice, and that makes plus. If it's plus, then obviously two pluses make a plus. And then I would get the, the derivative. But, oh, second derivative, thank you. Uh, but if I hook these two together here, watch what happens. This is saying that, I'll do a substitution into here, the second derivative of a wave equation with respect to the variable x would be the same as taking the second derivative of a wave function with respect to time and then multiplying by 1 over the speed squared. And so this you will often see as the wave equation also. I will tell you for this chapter it will serve us best to think of the wave equation this way. But the last section of this chapter looks at the wave equation this way and then solve some uh, uh, some equations using the derivatives and, and differential equations. But again, that's later on really in your, your education. So don't be surprised if you see this someday and they say this is the wave equation. Or don't be surprised if you see this and they say this is the wave equation. They really mean the one in the, in the same. Whichever, whichever way they happens to be useful here. Well, let's keep going. As I said, this chapter is all about waves in general. And a neat property of waves happens when we come and bring two waves together. I mean, now that we have done a little bit of math and said, okay, the equation for a wave, a single wave, I'll call it wave number one, would be x plus or minus vt, right? It has to be that. But what if I had a second wave? Wave number two. And wave number two, which I will just represent again in an abstract form, y2. But it's got to be x plus or minus vt. Has to be that, no matter what it is. But if I got two waves, in fact, maybe these would be my two waves. Maybe I have a Gaussian wave and a Lorentzian wave. But what if they come together? What if I make a pulse that goes down and as it reflects, I make a second pulse and they meet? What do I get in the middle? So, one wave and another wave. <laughs> right, and good. A lot of you are remembering from the Physics 102, we call this the overlap. We call this an interference. If they're both up, we call that a constructive interference. Good. If one is up and one is down, we called it a 
destructive interference. And in fact, if they were exactly the same shape up and down, it would be total destructive interference. But here's what you're saying mathematically. You are saying that if you bring these two waves together, what is the result? Wave one plus wave two. It's really that simple. And so we're going to have fun with that math. Actually more in chapter 18 than we are here in 16. So a week from today you'll see me doing this a lot. I will say, hey, let's find out the equation for the total effect of these two waves. And I heard somebody else use a fancy word called superpositioning. Good. In fact, let me save a little time and I write it on the board. But this is called the superpositioning of a wave. A nice property of waves then is if you have wave one, and that comes together, as you said, interferes either constructively or destructively, we do a superposition. We just add the two together. And so that's a fancy word of saying what to do mathematically. Add them together. No different than you would do if somebody asked, you know, how much money do you have? And you would look in your wallet or your purse. You would look in your uh, glove box in your car. You would look in the ashtray in your car. You would probably look on the floor in your bedroom, under the cushions in your sofa, and go, okay, add them all together. That is the total amount. You probably even go one step further and say, oh yeah, but you know, I borrowed uh, 750 from my roommate, so I need to subtract off 750. So you would put everything together. That's superpositioning. You would add all the pluses, you would subtract all the minuses, and the total result here. And so that's what I'm trying to say here. The superpositioning. Two waves come together, it's a combination. I'm not getting a good reflection on this one. I think because they're kind of hitting here. But I was kind of hoping you saw it. Could you, could you see that if I had two up pulses, the result kind of gets bigger? Let me make a, let me start on this end, see if it will reflect better. But if I make an up, and when it comes back, if it's an up, what happens right there? Do you see how the up and the up combine? And so if one wave is saying lift the rod two centimeters and the other wave is saying lift it three centimeters, when they come together it is lift it five centimeters. I like to kind of draw it this way, that if I have wave number one this way, here's wave number one, and just to kind of make it clear that I've got two different waves with two different shapes, I'll make a little square box, which isn't really exactly easy to do with this machine here. But if I bring those two together, when they overlap, what will it look like? <laughs> That's what we mean by the superpositioning. It literally is as, as simple and hopefully as that is supposed to be, it is just the sum of the two. You add the two together and let me continue on. What would happen next? It may, hopefully you can see it here in the math. What would the next picture look like? Yeah, I'm hoping you will see that the rounded hump would continue in that direction. The square hump would continue in that direction. And unlike two objects coming together, like a baseball and a softball, when they come together, you didn't get one lump bigger ball, and you certainly didn't get the baseball to continue to go that way, and the softball to continue to go that way. There was a collision, a ricochet, forces, and bouncing up. We don't have that. Because there is no material. There's just energy. And so that's why the behavior of waves is different. They cross right through each other. And not a surprise, I think, to you, because sound waves, you do that all the time. I mean, sound waves, you'll be in a group of people with everybody talking, and the waves all pass through. And if I wanted to hear that voice, that wave comes right through. It doesn't come through when this person talk ricochets it around. I say, wait, wait, wait what'd you say? He just pushed your waves out of the wave with his waves. That, that doesn't happen, right? And they just travel right through. Of course, sometimes it's hard to decipher this wave when you got this wave coming to your ear at the same time, and you say, well, I didn't quite make out what you were saying. Uh, obviously, the wave got there, but I had the effect of the other waves, too, and uh, I, it kind of drowned it out what you were saying. But the, that's the superposition of those waves as they come to your eardrum, yeah. So, what if 
be accurate to say, while listening to your lecture, I mean, your voice is bouncing off all the walls, all the small crevices, like in the bricks and whatever the stucco ceiling is. So what am I, what I'm hearing, or any other student, is the superposition of your voice in throughout the room towards our ears. Well, yes and no. I mean, you, you, yeah. in other words, you would, if there was no other sounds in here, and I started to talk, the first thing you would hear is the waves right from my voice to you. Um, later on in the conversation, certainly my first part of my conversation might bounce off the ceiling, which of course is why we put the cork up there. So. Okay, but there, so there is a reflection that will get to your ears. So there really would be a superpositioning of something I said earlier with something I said later coming to your ears. But hopefully the stuff that ricocheted off the walls comes with such a low intensity that you don't really pick it up. I was thinking of like phase change with different materials. Yeah, 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 no. So a good auditorium, and this I wouldn't call a good auditorium, but a good auditorium stops those re re reflections. And so you'll see, uh, like our th new theater, if you've got a chance to be in there, you'll see the walls are all coated with foamy soft materials and cone-shaped materials. And so the sound wave from the stage goes right to the audience and the audience doesn't get the the, you know, the reflections and you don't worry about the, the superposition. But yeah, the, you, you could get it. In fact, there is, here, here, hello, 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 yeah, it's, hello, it goes bing, 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 bing. And it always, when I stand right here, it always catches me, you know, and it catches me off guard. And, and uh, it's a, I hear my own voice a, a moment later here and it, it throws me off. Um, but anyways, that's the superposition. Now notice these are in the up direction. And so we would call that constructive interference as we mentioned. Let me, let me draw another picture because the same idea can be drawn and mathematically and conceptually it's the same. So for us who are going to be very mathematically analytically this semester, it doesn't matter whether it's constructive or destructive. We just say add the two waves together. But if one wave has a negative sign in it, it might look something like this. What would happen if an up pulse traveling to the right came along and met a down pulse going to the left? And so this is Y1 and this is Y2. But the point I'm trying to get across here in superposition is these two waves is nothing more than the combination of those two. So if you want to know what the total wave is, just, just add them together. And like I said, we're going to do a lot of that. Not so much in this chapter. It's more chapter 18 where we actually use this principle. This, we just learn about the, the principle here and then we start using it a lot in chapter 18. So you're going to see that next Tuesday. But what would happen when these come together? Yeah, if these are supposed to represent the same shape, this is saying lift the rod up, say, three centimeters, and this is saying push the rod down three centimeters, then that means the total is zero. And so at that small moment, anyways, you would have what we would call destructive interference. In fact, right before it, I should probably draw right before, because I think right before it looks kind of interesting, too, where this down... just matches up with that up. And I want to point out that notice this is not any bigger than that one and this is not any lower than that one. Although I think visually it looks that way, doesn't it? When you see this way up here and that way down there, I don't know. Does it look like it got bigger or something? To me it always does when I draw that picture and when I try to make it happen on these waves, to me it looks like, oh it got bigger for a moment. It didn't. It just, they got close together. And then right afterwards, what would it look like? Well, there's the up. There's the down. And again, want to illustrate, this up here is the same as it was before. This down here is the same as it was before. But again, I think visually, it just kind of looks really big because you've got the top here and the bottom there and they just went from being flat to there. And just kind of get a visual of it got bigger. But I, what I really want to point out then is again, like over there, here's what we mean. They would just pass right through each other. 
Okay, there's no reflection, there's no movement of the wave, the wave continues on. Waves are not deflected by other waves. These are not material, these are, these are waves. And that's why we are discussing it now, and we did not discuss it in Physics 121. It's, these are mechanical waves, but they're waves, they're not mechanics. So those two middle pictures are good surfing waves or bad surfing waves? Well, uh, okay, so if I tried to give an example of this, I'll, I'll go to surfing. Um, this is probably not a real good example with waterways because these waves are going in the opposite direction. You don't usually have those for the waves coming in. Although I have definitely seen during heavy surf and a week, a week and a half ago when we had that heavy surf, you could see this where a big wave will come in and it's so big it'll go up the coat and then it'll reflect off the seawall and it will go back out. And so now you have a wave going out and a wave coming in. It usually looks more like this. They're both up and when it's kind of neat to watch when they come together it's like whoosh and the water splashes up really high and then goes on its own way. So it was more of a constructive interference in opposite directions than it was de destructive. And so these are opposite directions. But another good example of surf but it's not really illustrated with this picture is you could have a beach and you could have storm number one and storm number two heading to the coastline. And in that sense they're not in opposite directions so that's where it's different. But what you can have is because the spacing between the waves, the wavelengths can be different. At one moment in time the crest from one and the trough from another line up and so what comes into the beach or what is happening on the beach at that moment is flat. And many people look at that and they go, oh, there's no waves coming in. And I just want to say, oh yeah, there's waves. <laughs> but it's destructive interference. And that's when the surfers go paddling out there. They say, hey look, the water's calm, this is the time to get out there. Get out past the surf before the waves start coming in. Because a moment later the waves are going to come in. Although, I would say the waves are already coming in. It's just destructive interference. Because what's going to happen a moment later? And usually in our area it's like, 13 minutes, the surf beat is 10 to 13 minutes, but another what you'd call a set comes in. And so about 10 minutes later, the crests of this one line up with the crests of that one, and then what you get illustrated here is constructive interference. And so again, you don't see two waves coming in, but what you see are big waves coming in. And so we go from destructive to constructive interference. And the rate at which it goes back and forth, um, it's called the beats. They don't use that word this chapter, but they do in chapter 18. In that case, it would be the surf beat. If it was music, you would call it the beat of the music as it goes from louder, softer, louder, softer as you go from constructive to destructive interference. So that's what we're used to, the, the surf beat. And what's interesting in all of this is that usually when you get like destructive here, a couple miles down the coast, these two storms are constructive. So at any given moment, you would be saying, okay, nobody's surfing here. But people are surfing here. Because we do have conservation of energy. So at any place where we have constructive, a little bit later we have to, or somewhere else we have to have destructive to balance that whole energy part of the, of the system here. Uh, sound waves are a really good example of this and radar waves are too. Especially these days that those active uh, noise counseling headphones are getting real popular. How do they work? Taking the sound and the right, you put on the headphones and besides uh, having a speaker that plays sound, they actually have a microphone that picks up the sound. And so what will happen is if I put them on and somebody over here is running a jackhammer, as the sound waves go into my headset, the little microphone picks up that sound. Not only does it pick it up, but then it plays back exactly the same sound as that jackhammer, but in opposite phase. And so the sound waves coming from the jackhammer plus the sound waves produced by my headphones cancel each other out and that's why they call them noise counseling headphones. In addition to that the headphones probably are also playing some music so they continue to play the music and the jackhammer plus the original jackhammer and hopefully the two jackhammers cancel off and I just get my music. 
And the ones that are real expensive are really good. I, I can't afford it, but the Bose ones I love. I was in fries, you put them on and, you know, the store is kind of noisy and you put them on and kind of muffles the sound and then you turn the switch on. Dead silent. It's like that movie Gravity. I mean, just like, <laughs> where'd everything go? You know, and then you turn on the CD that you want to listen to. And even though there's kids running around all over the place behind, you, you don't hear any of that. You just hear the CD you put in. So, could real impressive. Radar, the same thing. If you have an F-22 coming in on a bombing run and they send a radar up, you send a radar back out of phase. What goes back to the radar station? Nothing. And there's no plane up there. Until the bomb drops. <laughs> yeah. uh, do you hear that destructive interference? Do you need to have the same amplitude of your weight? Of your well, to get total zero, yes. And you can see it in the math. The, the, uh, you would have to have same amplitude, same shape, everything would have to be exactly the same to get exactly zero. And in this case, when they're going opposite directions, you'd only get zero for one moment. But if they're going in the same direction, then you can get zero indefinitely for that direction. Which, pro which means also you would not get zero in other directions. And so again, this F-22 coming in this way with the radar coming that way, you send it that way. Hopefully your constructive interference is that way so that nobody on the ground gets a signal that there's a plane there and only a satellite could pick up the fact that there is a plane there and then hopefully that country doesn't have satellites like we do so we could pick up the stealth airplanes but they can't <laughs> and fortunately no other country has stealth quite yet but they're all getting close if everything needs to be the same wouldn't like the ground missile side I guess could they just change the frequency of their radar field? oh and right and then that's the counter thing and then but couldn't the F-22 change it yeah so who's faster whose technology is better right Right. So that's the constant game, right? 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 Uh, in fact, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, during the Cold War, there was a, 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 an idea of building, uh, I guess it was the B-2, uh, because the B-2, it's a huge plane, yeah. but by the time you send a radar and it, reflects back, what little reflects back, and then the, 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 uh, the counseling of it, it, it appears to be at the size of a B. And so when they're building the B-2, they said, nobody will ever detect this. Somebody would have to build a radar as sophisticated enough to detect a B. Well, so the Russians built a radar <laughs> that was as complex and as detailed to detect a B. Yeah. For just that reason. So, yes, there is the constant technology wars. Yeah. 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 Now, a big, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, and, and, and I should be careful here because I'm not 100% on exactly what they use because all of this is obviously classified information and they, they won't let anybody know. So a lot of it is speculation on people with technological backgrounds on what is really happening. The, the, the 22, the F-22, and certainly the first one, what is that, the F-117, they don't probably send any counseling. They are just, between their shape and their absorbent material, that's enough to keep them looking small. And so they don't look as small as a B. Now the B-22, uh, the B-2 I understand, which is a much bigger plane, not only absorbs the radar, but then what it does reflect then cancels off. And so that, that big old plane looks even smaller than the F-22s and the F-117s. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so then you have to be even more sophisticated to, as you said, change with radars or multiple radar sites. And then there, there, there's other things, but we better keep going. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Question? Yeah. 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 Oh. Oh, yeah, well, yeah, there's a good point. Could you, yeah, yeah, build a, a shaking machine in the building that would be exactly opposite to the earthquake. And so, yeah, in theory. I doesn't matter. Okay. Doesn't matter. Yeah. 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 But uh, in theory, that should work. All right, well, again, I'll keep going because my, my point here is, like I said, to, to try to get you as much information about waves. And this is the chapter just uh, generally on waves. Uh, so far, I have been 
talking about waves and, and at times getting more specific about say radar waves or sound waves uh, and your author says at this point in the chapter let, let's look at a very common wave that is useful for study in the sense of learning I don't know if it's useful in the study in terms of application because sound waves and water waves and light waves and material waves and el electromagnetic waves in general are far more useful in terms of technology but your author says a good place for students to start here is what if we just take an object and pull it under attention and I have a spring but uh, your author discusses more about a string but whether it's a string or a spring, I think you can see that I can have a wave here too. And so if I make a little pulse, it will travel down. And in this case, we'll reflect back and come back. I don't know if I can get you to see this, but what if I put very little tension on it? Compared to a lot of tension. You see anything different? Yeah, the speed changed. The speed changed based on how much it is being pulled, how much tension. And this is the part that, uh, as I said, I'm going to skip the derivation here. Your author does a really good job, does about a half a page. I'd encourage you to go through the derivation. He does something like this. I'll kind of mention it to get us started. But he says, let's imagine a string or a spring and you pull it with a certain tension. And then, you make a wave. And he kind of breaks this apart and does a little Newton's second law here. He says if you look at that point right there, there would be a tension that way and a tension that way. The tension in the y direction if we call this the angle theta would be T sine theta twice. Now like I said I, I'm going to try to save a little time and not do the derivation because I think your author does a good job here but I want you to see the word T for tension. Okay? T stands for the tension. How much tension is in there? And since he says this is Newton's second law it must be equal to MA. Well, what's F? Mass of the whole string. Right, just a little piece of the string. If you're just analyzing that little piece, then he's talking about just that little chunk. And so he uses this symbol mu, which would be the mass per length. And this then is the tension on the string. Tension. Mass per length. And so again, without doing the derivation, I'm hoping you will see that wouldn't there be two principles determining the speed? The tension being one of them. How much do you pull on that? How much tension do you have? Which, by the way, is the lab we will do this week. It's a, it's a great lab. You're going to put a string out there. You're going to change the tension. You're going to start with a little tension. Measure the speed. More tension. Measure the speed. More tension. Measure the speed. More tension. Measure the speed. And you're going to see that the speed does change with tension. I'm hoping without doing the derivation that kind of makes sense because it is the tension that's snapping it back down. And I want you to see the symbol T. The other thing I want you to see is what is stopping or resisting the motion is the mass of the string. Now not the whole string but the mass density. How much does it weigh per little length? A dm dx. That's what he means by the symbol mu in his equation. And again you'll do that in the lab because we have three different strings. We will give you a string that has a small mu, a medium mu, and a large mu. And you are to see that the mass of the string does come into play. It does have an effect. As you would 
expect, I hope. So again, without doing a whole derivation, I think you can see that the speed depends upon tension and mass. In fact, you already saw kind of it over here. These are not strings, but you would notice, notice how these rods are longer than these rods, which means those rods have more mass. Probably more appropriate would be more moment of inertia because they are twisting instead of translating. But certainly these have more inertia. So doesn't that travel slower than that? And that's because they have more inertia. And the point I'm trying to get at is that the speed of a wave does depend on those two factors. And so without doing the derivation, your author comes up, and I think the square root is a little surprising. The fact that it has a t and a mu is not. The fact that the t is in the numerator and the mu is in the denominator is not a surprise. You would expect more tension, more speed, more mass, less speed. Th those kind of make sense. I think the square root is a little bit of a surprise, but when you go through the derivation, you'll, you'll see it. And in fact, that whole idea can be expanded to any waves that there is going to be some restoring property, an elastic property, and there's going to be some resistive property, which I will call it its inertial property. And as we see for the rest of this semester, every time we deal with waves, whether they be sound waves or whether they be light waves or whether they be waves on a string or whether they be uh, the waves on there, that there's going to be an elastic property. And if you increase that, you increase the tension, you're going to get more speed. And if you increase the mass, you're going to get less speed and it works like a, like a square root. Again, that's why this week's lab is, is pretty good because you will do exactly that. You will then see, is this equation true? Is it valid? So between now and tomorrow, before you do the lab, go through the derivation. If not, at least know that equation because that's the this equation for the lab. And so again, a nice mathematical property about weight. I'll keep going. There are some really other interesting things about waves. Let me do this. Uh oh, I lost my coupler. But what might happen, actually before I couple it, I'll try this. Let me leave it uncoupled. You saw this already. What happens if I make a wave, it goes to the end, and what happens at the end? Does, does the wave continue on past? No. no. It runs out of rods, right? So what does it do instead? Do you see it reflect? Now, what if I changed it a little bit? This wave at the end, what if I clamped it? So this one at the end can't move. Will it still reflect? What will happen here? Did it reflect? Did you see anything different? It inverted it, didn't it? And so it does have... Oh, I see the problem. This is all solder broke there. Okay, but if you watch this, there is a reflection still, but it's an inverted reflection. Watch, I'll take it away. If I do it now, does it reflect? Yeah, but not inverted. Now, we're going to need to keep this in mind here because as we take waves and put them together in a superposition and we have two waves coming together, we need to know which way they are, right? Up or down. Let me keep going with this. Let me put these two waves together and begin to ask ourselves this question. Why does in one case... it invert and not the other. And, and that might be a little bit easier to see here. In this one, 
I have it clamped. On this one, I don't have it clamped. Or maybe I shouldn't have coupled them together yet. But if I make the wave go down there, what ends up happening is this rod right here lifts up, but there's not a rod behind it to give it its energy, to pull it down. It's kind of like this last rod is just doing this. And if I did that, wouldn't that start a wave back the other direction? And so the rods in the middle, what happens to them is as they lift up, the one next to it, it pulls it up. So this one gives its energy to the next one, which gives it to the next one, which gives it to the next one. And so that's why the energy keeps going that way. But when you get to this last rod, that doesn't happen. There is no next rod dragging it down. There is no next rod to give its energy to. And because of that, it's as simple as this last rod has gone up. And so it makes a pulse in the other direction, and it makes it up. However, if this last one is rigidly locked into place, like this one here, as I make a pulse that is up, and is up, and is up, this can't actually go up. Now the reason, of course, it can't go up is because I have a clamp here which the clamp means it is pulling down, right? So this pulls up, but the clamp pulls down. If I were to pull down on here, what would I get? A negative pulse, an inverted pulse. So reflections are kind of interesting because you can have a reflection that is either inverted or not inverted. When would you get an inversion? When you hit something solid. Something that's more rigid than the rods you have. Watch this. I'm going to couple these together and I'm going to make the wave start on this end and watch what happens when it gets to here and reflects back. There will be a discontinuity and there will be a reflection. And I am hitting something that is more rigid, heavier if you will, than that one. And so I will get a reflection and it will be inverted. It won't be solid, so will it start some waves that go onto here? Yes. And watch what happens what I do next. What happens if I start the wave on this side? And I make the wave. And it goes from here to here to here to here to here. And then reflects at this discontinuity. Will it invert? No. It's hitting something. Something different. Will there be a reflection? Yes. But will it be inverted? No. And that, I think, is probably one of the toughest things in this section. And I, many of you, I hopefully remember that from 102, that when we have a reflection, sometimes it's inverted and sometimes it is not. The real physics to it is to get that picture and ask yourself, are you hitting something more solid? Watch. In this case, the answer is yes. I am hitting something more solid. Solid. I'm hitting longer rods versus shorter rods. So as it goes up, maybe I should twist this a little bit. You guys over there can see. Watch the reflection. Did it reflect? And did it turn upside down? Could you see that? I'll do it again. Pulse, reflection, right there. I know this one travels fast, but it'll go up, hit that, and it will be inverted. Let me try the other direction. The other direction doesn't go quite as fast. I will make an up pulse and watch here. It will reflect, but will it be inverted? No. And so that's my reflection that's not inverted. And it's too bad this solder broke because that wasn't much of a reflection to, to see, but hopefully 
It's enough right there. You see it? It does reflect. And so this little piece here, I think, is one of the things that throws students off in later chapters. They go, oh, I forgot the reflection. Oh, I forgot the reflection and it inverted. And so again, I'll ask you, you always have a reflection when you change from one medium into another. But do you always get an inversion? No. When do you get an inversion? You hit something that's a little more solid. Put another way, if it is more solid, more inertia, that means it also is going to travel slower. So if you are going into something where the waves travel slower, there's going to be an inversion. And that's what we saw here. Remember they're fast here, slow here. I'm hitting something more solid, something where the waves travel slower. And so as I go forward here, right there, I hit something solid. The waves travel slower in here. So when I go from fast to slow, there is a reflection that is inverted. But when I go from slow to fast, that means I'm hitting something less dense. Is there an inversion? No. And so I think you guys are getting it right there. There is a reflection with no inversion. Now, let's also make this clear. Was there some of the wave transmitted to the other side? Yeah, I think you saw that. When I made the wave here, I'm hoping you saw, not only was there a reflection here, but some of the energy was transmitted. So the energy of this wave hit here and kind of split. Some of it went and transmitted, some of it reflected. The part that reflected was inverted, the part that was transmitted did not invert, did it? Did you catch that? I mean, watch it closely here. There's the transmitted one. Did it invert? No. How about this direction? Did some of the energy transmit? Did it invert? No. The transmitted piece never inverts. And that kind of makes it easy. Or it makes it hard because we forget about that. Oh, wait a minute. What about the transmitted wave? Uh. Simple answer. Transmitted wave never inverts. But the reflection one may. And so that's the one to keep your eye on. So again, going from slow to fast. No inversion on the reflection. And none on the transmitted, but there never is on the transmitted. Going from fast to slow. The reflected is inverted. The transmitted is not. So Never is. Yeah. But there would the waves both be equal in magnitude or something? Uh, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. If they would be... If there was no reflection... No reflection. And, and it transmitted to the other medium, right. would the waves would be equal? I mean, one of them would be faster than the other, but would they be equal? Well, they'd be equal in energy. And what we're about to talk now, about next is their energy depends on how fast are they traveling and their amplitude. So if you change the speed, you're going to have to change the amplitude a little bit, too, because we are going to have conservation of energy. But I should also point out that could never physically happen, because if you do go from one medium into another, where it goes faster, that split right there, you're always going to get some reflection and some transmitted. Um, and that, that's actually a consequence of conservation of energy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, okay, so we always have reflection occurring when there's like a transfer of energy between, I guess, like different materials or bodies. Or so when you go from one medium to another. Okay, right. right. So um, would, let's say we have two different materials, but they have the same inertia. Would the would there still be reflection in the like first material? Uh, now, you said half the story. You said they had the same inertia. Do they have the same elastic properties? Yeah. Okay. So if they ha if it's if these two are the same, then their speed is the same, okay. and there would be no reflection. Okay. It would be like saying material one, okay. material two. Do I have a reflection at that point? Okay. See. So, no reflection occurs until there is a change. In elasticity or inertia. Right. Okay. 
Right. And so putting those together means change in speed. There's a change in speed, then we're going to get a reflection back. And depending on how much the change in speed is, that will tell us how much gets reflected. Although we don't take our waves quite that far. But your next class on waves, you will get to what they would call the matching of the wave, the impedance matching of the wave. How much actually transmit, how much actually re reflects. And you'll see it does get related to the velocity. And so when the two velocities are exactly the same, none gets reflected. The larger the difference in their speed, the larger that gets reflected. Sound waves are a really good example because sound waves in water are five times faster than in the air. What that means is most of the energy reflects off the surface of the water. Trying to get somebody's attention who is underwater is very difficult because the, as you yell really loud, most of it just reflects off the surface. Very little penetrates into the water. The speed difference is so, so dramatic. But the speed difference between hot air and cold air, or the speed difference between warm water and cold water is very little. So as somebody yells from in the shade to in the sun, even though there's a change in speed, it's very little change in speed, very little reflection, and the person standing in the sun easily hears the person in the shade yelling at him. Yeah. The, uh, the tran transverse waves carry on to the air molecules, or do the perpendicular movement of the rods just displace the air? Is that, do you understand what I'm saying? Uh, the wave carry on to the air molecules, or does the movement of the rods just displace the air? Oh, uh, I guess I would say that there probably is, as this rods go up and they hit the air molecules, they probably are going and pushing this. So some of the energy is being dissipated into waves that are now molecules hitting each other. Oh, now, I, I see. Uh, no, molecules in the air um, do not have a a force between them. So in the air molecules you could never have transverse waves. I could not take an air molecule and lift it up and expect it to pull the next one up to it. There's no connection between them. So for uh, air or any gas we say there is only longitudinal waves. There's only one colliding into another. You can't get this effect. Yeah. It's even hard to get it in water, um, water waves um, in the water. It's easy to get the water on the surface. And so on the surface you see that because as the water pulls up, gravity pulls it down and there's a surface tension between them. But, but you, it's not as likely to get. All right, well, I'll keep going. Actually, we're doing pretty good, although... Not, well, I think we'll just finish. We probably just won't get a chance to do any examples in the back. But I do want to give you a helpful hint of the last three homework problems because they are uh, some uh, magenta ones that uh, I noticed people have had trouble. So let me not forget that. So what time are we done? 10.05? So we've got 20 minutes. Let's do some more math here. Um, we should go back to our, our sine waves here. Uh, someplace earlier, ah, here it is. We had argued that in order to mathematically describe a wave, it has to be both a function of space and time. In addition to that, space and time had to be connected together with this. <coughs> and probably the most useful way for us to get started is to talk about the most common shape to you and that sine wave. So don't be surprised as you get into the homework that most of your waves are sine waves. I think the very first homework problem actually has a Lorenzian wave and that's about it and then all the other problems have a sine wave. And so let's take a time to do a little bit more mathematics with the sine wave starting with this question. Is there anything else I can do to this equation that would still keep it a wave but give me some flexibility with it? And here's what I mean by this. 
Could I put that out in front and still have a wave? Sure, and what would that represent? Yeah, that's the number in front. That's what we call the prefactor. That's its amplitude. And so as I come over here and I say, all right, here is a small amplitude. Here is a big amplitude. But though both of those are waves. Fair enough? And so just like we saw the last chapter, we see that putting an A in front does have an important physical meaning. You're going to be asked questions about it. It represents the amplitude. But what else? How would I mathematically represent the difference between something that has a long wavelength and something that has a small wavelength? Aren't those both waves? But how are they represented in that equation? Where does wavelength fit into here? Yeah, and the reason I put a parenthesis inside here is because if I added another factor there, wouldn't I still have a wave? Mm -hmm. And what would that other factor do? Yeah, that would could control this rate at which the sine function repeats it itself. <laughs> In fact, how would lambda, which is the symbol we would like to use mathematically for when it repeats itself, fit into that equation? Short wavelength, long wavelength. Ah, good. It would fit right here. In other words, this put together with the x. Let me just put question mark and x together. When that is a full cycle of 2 pi, isn't that where the trig functions repeat itself every 2 pi? So what I would really like is I would like this question mark plus one wavelength to be a full cycle, right? In other words, this question mark out in front should really be represented by a 2 pi over wavelength. That's how I could control mathematically different wavelengths. And so a more detailed of a sine wave would still have your x plus or minus vt, but it would have a prefactor that would have the 2 pi over lambda in front of it. And that way, if I said lambda was 10 meters, then when x is equal to 10 meters, these two cancel off and you get one cycle, 2 pi. And when I put x as 20 meters, let's say, 20 meters divided by a wavelength of 10 meters, that's a 2. 2 times 2 pi is 4 pi. That would be the second cycle. So this prefactor is exactly what I'm looking for. What factor could I put in here that could allow me to adjust for different wavelengths yet still have a mathematical equation that represents a wave and that will do it for me? In fact, that is kind of mathematically complicated. So let's simplify it a little bit. Your author likes to write it this way says let's write it as a sine and let's do the distributive property. We can write this as 2 pi x over lambda plus or minus 2 pi v over lambda t. And if we look closer at this one, 2 pi over lambda and realize that velocity is lambda times frequency. The lambdas can cancel off and we get 2 pi f. And what do we call 2 pi f? The angular frequency. And so the equation for a wave can be simplified a little bit by writing it in terms of its angular frequency. And so I want you to note then that this, or maybe I should say this, which is all of that, is the same as this. We will also do one more thing 
this 2 pi over lambda, we like to use the symbol k. Maybe more appropriate should be kappa, so you don't uh, confuse it with the spring constant. But I'll call it kx. And so just like this omega was referred to in its mathematical form, its angular frequency, um, whoops, angular frequency, then this k would be a nice mathematical but not physical description, but it would be its angular wave number. And so we're back to like we had in the last chapter. In the last chapter, I felt it was better to talk about frequency physically than omega. But mathematically, it was better to deal with omega. Because the math had to do with a full cycle. So we had both a physical frequency, f, and a mathematical frequency, angular frequency. We have the same thing here. Physically, I like to discuss wavelength. How long is its wavelength? That's something I can point at physically. But mathematically, I don't like the 2 pi and the k, so I like to use the angular wave number. And so my point is that this is the equation that will be seen and used a lot to representing the mathematical function of a sine wave. It's really nice mathematically. Unfortunately, I don't think it's very nice physically. But if you remember that the k, the angular wave number, is connected to its wavelength, you will hopefully be able to go from the math to the physics. Just like last chapter, if you remember that the frequency is more of a physical thing, but the angular frequency is helpful mathematically, we can go back and forth from one to another. Well, the last thing your author does, and again, a nice derivation, but to save time, I thought it might be best not to try to do the derivation. It's an energy consideration. He says, all right, let's look at the flow of energy. It, I'll come back to the one I started to show you earlier and the one that um, you'll do tomorrow in lab is you will take, and actually in lab you'll take a string, but I have this long spring, but if I go ahead and I make a pulse and I made a bunch of pulses and send it on down, then there is this energy that is flowing how do we calculate it? How much energy is flowing? I mean, we've been talking about this from the start of this lecture, that there would be a flow of energy. Well, what would determine that energy? Now, without doing the derivation, let's see if we can kind of guess here. Don't you think it would have something to do with the speed? I mean, obviously, if this thing is traveling fast, you would expect then the rate at which energy to travel is fast because the energy is stored in that little hump, right? In fact, if you look closely at the hump, wouldn't you expect how far I pull it up? Like, wouldn't you expect that to have more energy than something with a small amplitude? Because the energy is related to that elastic energy. How much do you pull it? And so those two I would expect to be in there. I would expect, hey, how fast is it going? What's the amplitude? Or what else? Well, frequency, exactly. If I did something like that, its kinetic energy would have to be going real fast, real slow, real fast, real slow. So I would expect also its frequency to be in there. And since the energy is connected to the weight of the rod, right? This kinetic energy does have to do with mass. I guess I would also expect it to be related to how much weight we have. And that's what you'll see in the derivation. And I'm going to put the equation on the board. But the flow of energy here, how much flows down? If I have a wave on a string, so I'll call this energy flow. 
power. The rate at which energy is flowing. Power. DE, DT. How much energy flows down the rod? I would expect it to be related to what is the mass density of that string? How much does it weigh? At what frequency is it? What amplitude does it have? What velocity is it traveling? I guess what I wouldn't have guessed, and so you have to kind of go through the derivation, is I wouldn't have guessed that it depends on the square of the frequency. Well, maybe I would have because, you know, frequency has to do with speed and speed, it's kinetic energy, has to do with velocity squared. So, maybe that kind of makes sense. Amplitude. Amplitude. I don't know if I would have guessed squared. Well, but maybe I would have. Doesn't it have to do with the potential energy when you stretch a spring? I mean, what was the energy to spring when you stretched it? One half K X squared. Okay, so, so maybe that makes sense. Maybe, maybe if I pull this rod twice as far, the amplitude's twice as much, but that's really four times more energy when I, when I pull it. Okay, so maybe it's not too bizarre, and you'll see that in the derivation. As they work out the derivation, you will see that all four factors here determine how much energy is flowing, the rate at which it is, it is flowing. And the fact that it comes to frequency squared and velocity squared is, is kind of interesting. And so again, without doing a derivation, I'll put a box around it and say that's what you will be asked. You will be asked to look at the flow of, of energy down a string. To be quite honest, we're not going to be that interested in the flow of energy down a string, but we are going to be very interested on Thursday of how much energy flows from our sound waves. And so we're going to use this to extend on to from string waves to sound waves. But let me just talk about sound waves because I think many of you are a little bit familiar with sound waves in terms of speakers. Look at what this is really saying. What does this say about the high frequencies in a speaker system? There's lots of energy in those higher ones. Which simply means this, that if you wanted to produce sound waves at a high frequency with enough energy, whatever that enough energy is, you don't really need much amplitude. And so most of you, I think, are somewhat familiar with the speakers, especially the small little speakers, the tweeters there. They can produce quite a lot of volume with really very little movement. You don't have to move the paper diaphragm very much. Their amplitude is really small. And because of that, there's not much mechanical motion needed to make loud, high frequency sounds. They're also annoying, so they make great alarms. You don't have to have a big speaker. Uh, they, people pick them up, a lot of energy, easy to do. But let's look at the reverse of this. Because I think some of you probably have those uh, home sound systems, the you know 7.1 surround sound system. And part of that is the subwoofer, the low, low frequencies. So what does that say about this? Small. So if you want to get a lot of energy coming out into your room or your theater at a low frequency, how do you get a lot of energy? You have to have a big amplitude. And so the big challenge of these subwoofers here is you have to have something move a significant distance. I know the one in my living room, the subwoofer is about this long, about this wide. Well, still this. And the little mechanical moving part goes the whole distance. So it's moving about 18 inches back and forth compared to probably less than a millimeter on the little subwoofer there just to get that power out into the room so you know I can watch Die Hard explode and fill it in my chest you know and that's <laughs> the whole point of that subwoofer get that power out in the in the room well with the last five minutes I have left let me help you 
a little bit with what I can. I, I was hoping to do examples, but I figured we probably wouldn't get that far. At least we finished the whole chapter. That I'm surprised. But watch the last three. The last three undoubtedly are the hardest of the homework problems and have given students a little bit of a struggle in the past. And so I will help you get started with those last three. Um, they, I think the last two are blue and the last one is magenta. But they really kind of do the same thing. Somewhere along the line in those three, they say, what would happen if you had a string and on one of the problems it's just a string nothing tied at the end on others of the problems they put a mass hanging from it but why don't I start with ignoring the mass down here and they say let's do this let's just kinda tap the end of the string that will make a little pulse. The pulse will travel up, 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 up the length of the string. How long will it take? Well, before you get to this point, the problems in the chapter are much easier because they say, ignore, like you have one that looks like this. It says, ignore the mass of the string and so the velocity is the square root of the tension over mu. And so all you need to do is find the tension in the string and realize that distance per time is velocity. Since the velocity doesn't change, if the tension doesn't change, you can just say length of the string time it takes, right? But what if we consider the weight of the string? This is the challenge of the last three. Is the tension the same in the string? Down here would be a different tension than up there. And so the last, the third to the last one is like that. Where the tension changes, nothing is hanging on the end. The second to last one, the tension changes because we do have a weight hanging, but then we have a heavy string. The very last one, they change the density of the string. And so as the string moves along, it gets fatter and fatter and fatter. So the tension is the same, but the density is changing. Here's the key to all three of these. It's not as simple as just distance divided by time because we don't have a constant velocity. So what are you going to do? Well, let's write it as dx dt equals square root of t over mu. Let's rearrange this equation to say a little bit of time then is dx over the square root of t over mu. Which means a little bit of time is the square root of mu over t dx. If you integrate, you will get total time it takes for the pulse to go up. Don't do an integral with time, do an integral of space. And so you could go from zero to the length of the string. What you just need to find, how does the tension change with x? So you can do the integral. And so the third to the last and second to the last, the tension changes with position because we got to consider the weight of the string. In the very last problem, the mass density changes with position because as we go along the string, 
it gets heavier and heavier and heavier and heavier and heavier. But the key to all three of them is right here. Do this integral. Which really means find tension as a function of x or mu as a function of x. Then it's just a matter of doing an integral. And they're not an easy integral. It's got a square root. So that alone is going to be hard. But at least I think I've done the, the hard part for you. So good luck. Five after and uh, you can get started. And we'll go right into 17, believe it or not, on uh, Thursday here. So we're going to jam through these.